So would you say like your business partner, your keto guy, when he goes and runs a marathon, he's going to be eating beef jerky? Or I mean, how, how, how would you suggest somebody fuel for endurance running, you know, with, on a low carbohydrate diet? You know, we've seen the science and there's not a lot of great science, at least that I've seen that shows that that's really helpful. Well, first and foremost, I would like to say uh, out of the gate that I am not an expert in endurance running. You know, I'm a, a bodybuilding champion that had a, you know, a high level of cardiovascular fitness, but I haven't run marathons. You know, mm-hmm. So I, I want to qualify that. And that's really important. Okay. First and foremost, mm-hmm. but there are all sorts of people who I think do well on, um, you know, if you get into the research with Dom Nick D'Agostino and the extension of Special Forces, NASA agents in using ketones, ketogenic diets, and these type of things for endurance-based activities. Um, The research is very strong. He also believes in cycling keto for periods of time. Peter Atia is another guy out there. So we we see people that are producing that. The large majority, I think, are producing carbohydrates. So so let's say say it's even an 80-20. The question is, is how does the individual who be, may have a, a higher propensity for carbohydrates or a higher propensity for fats, how do they determine where they're at on that spectrum and so that they can produce a diet that is going to be supportive of their endurance goals, if that's what their goals are? Mm-hmm. And so um, that's kind of like the wheelhouse that people have. Now, my world to be to qualify one other piece is... I followed a very, a very high performance-based lifestyle as a, as a bodybuilding champion. Mm-hmm. And the trade-off of high performance is often compromised health. That's the real. So if you look at the statistics, okay, so what lives us, what helps us live long, lives us strong, right? Fitness is a part of it. So if we look at the three things that are going to determine, uh, positive likelihood for long-term health, muscle mass, cardiovascular fitness, and range of motion, mm-hmm. right? Because that's going to be yeah, cool. totally okay. And you could probably factor in bone density in there as well, because that's a big contributing factor. Okay. So if I go to the top two and a half percent of lean body mass and cardiovascular fitness and flexibility, I've got great outcomes. The second I start pushing into that upper tier level, I am going to be compromising some aspect of my life. So bodybuilders aren't living long times. High level endurance athletes aren't living long lives. And hyper flexible people don't live long lives. But if you're at the top end of that spectrum in all three areas, guess what? You've got an increased likely of positive outcomes. So I think we, there's a misidentification with our own selves is that we become legends in our own mind. Like I'm going to do cardio, <laughs> I'm going to be a fitness person. I'm going to run a marathon. Okay. You know what? All the benefits that are included in that are probably great. But when we start sweeping into that, I want to move into that upper echelon. There are going to be costs involved in that. And that's fine. And I think that's great. You know, life is fatal. Right. So in <laughs> your life, the way that you want, I'm a big um, proponent of pushing the performance parameter as hard as you can, because I do think over the long term, it starts to arc. But if you look at most career athletes, they end up playing the health game in the end. They go right. on the performance side. They usually get some compromising. And then as their life gets interrupted from their, their goals and drives for performance, they change their values and say, you know what? I just want to live a long life, a healthy life. And, and I think that's just the normal cycle of humanity, right? 